Judges chapter 14. Very few young people in the Bible ever achieved what God had originally attended, att- intended for them. I don't know if you've ever noticed that or not. Most of them, and the, if you'll check out young people in the Bible and follow their lives, most of them were deterred or tripped up or trapped up by the devil. And some never accomplished hardly anything that God wanted them to achieve. Some did quite a bit, but most hardly ever. And Samson is a classic example of a person whom before he was ever conceived, God wanted to raise up to deliver his people. And how Satan tripped up this young man is a picture of how Satan trips up most young people, or people in the younger years of their life, even you know, young married couples, and get them messed up so that they won't really ever know. If somebody said that success is not measured by what you've done, but it's measured by what you could have done against what you have done. What you could have done for Christ in your life, what your life could have amounted to. Most of us will come to the end of our lives and say, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Only what is done for Christ will last. Samson has been called the weak, strong man. The weak, strong man. Last week, as we preached through chapter 13, we talked about the nation of Israel and the retrogression of that nation, how that nation went backwards, how it got away from God. And then we said the second thing that this chapter taught us was that that a couple, a married couple, had a revelation from God. There was an angel of the Lord came and visited them and said, I want to raise up a son to deliver this nation from your family. And then we looked at the raising of that son and that he was a Nazarite. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute some more. We looked last week at the romance that that son had. And we talked about how that biblical romance ought to be handled. And then we finally got into the rebellion of Samson. And we preached on the pathway of the rebel. And I want to continue that theme this week in Samson's life in chapter 14. And let's look at verse 5 through 7. Verse 5 through 7. Then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath. And we said Timnath, that town means designated portion. And Samson wanted his designated portion. That's one of the lies that Satan always gets you with. You need to have your fun, your time. Your parents or your uncle or your aunt, they got to do what they wanted to do and they had their time of fun and games and sin and you need to have your designated portion. Then it says, And behold, a young lion roared against him. Verse 6 said, And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him and he rent him as he would have rent a kid and he had nothing in his hand. But he told not his father or his mother what he had done and he went down and talked with the woman and she pleased Samson well. I want us to read verses 8 and 9 in relationship to the message today. And after a time, he returned to take her. Now, understand this. They went down in the marriage ceremonies of that day, in the marriage situations. The father went down and made the arrangements to pay the dowry and the bride price. That's what his father and mother was doing the first time, although they did not want to do it and knew that it was out of the will of God. And the second time, they go down here to further consummate the marriage. And that's what it's talking about in verse 8. And after a time, he returned to take her. Often, there would many times be a year's difference between the time when the uh, his spouse was made and the marriage was consumed. He went down to take his wife. Not like what we're used to today. After a time, he returned to take her and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. Remember the first trip he took? He left his father and his mother. He took a side trip, got off the straight and the narrow, got on the broad road, went down to Timnath. And not only Timnath was designated portion, but it was a place of vineyard. He was a Nazarite. He was not to get near liquor, grapes, Dried grapes, anything of that, nation, uh, of that nature. And so here he is taking his tour down through there. He comes back at the later time to get his wife, and he thinks, you know, I remember killing a lion over there in the vineyard of Timnath. I think I'll just go back through there and check this thing out again. So that's what he's doing. He goes down through there to the place where he killed the lion. I mean, how many here has killed a deer, and you went back to the place where you killed the deer later on? Raise your hand. Raise your hand, really, honestly. All right. Okay, you get the idea, all right? He turned aside to see the carcass of the lion, and behold... There was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. And he took thereof in his hands and went on eating and came to his father and mother and he gave them and they did eat. But he told not them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. Now, I want you to remember that there was a verse in our Sunday school class that said, Be, what, be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil goeth about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Do you think that it might be possible 
That the Holy Ghost and Peter had in mind this passage of Scripture when he wrote that. Samson, be sober, be vigilant for your adversary. The devil, as a roaring lion, goes about seeking whom he may devour. Now the picture here is that this lion is a picture of Satan out to devour a young man and his potential for Jesus Christ or for just God's good in his life. Doesn't that doesn't mean he's going to be a preacher. Don't mean he's going to be some big body in the world. But it may be just a godly dad and a godly husband, a godly business person, a godly worker, whatever it may be. And he wants to destroy that effect in his life. Now, let's look at this Nazarite vow that he had upon him. A Nazarite was taking no strong drink, as we said, not even the dried raisins. It wouldn't be around it. The second vow of a Nazarite, he was to have no razor upon his head. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Whether you believe this or not, Samson was probably, at least probably 20 years old at this time. He may have been as up as 30 years old. He had never had a razor on his head. I'm going to tell you something. If you had met him on a dark night, he would have been a rough-looking customer. You'd have thought you had one of them wild hip eye radicals right in your hat. I'm talking his hair probably, especially being a Jew, his hair probably would have been very thick and very black. I mean, it could have been a massive mane that came down his body like this. I don't know that, but I, I, do, I know someone that's really kind of married into my family. And she didn't cut her hair for years, and it got, it got down in here, didn't it, Mary? I'm talking about hair down this long. I don't know how long Miss Samson's hair was, but he would have been some sight to look at. Now, that was a reproach to a man. And, but that reproach was to say to people that I have set my, I am not afraid of what you think about me. I am going to serve God, and I don't care whether you like it or don't like it. As for me and my house, I've deserved to serve, and that was a sign of what it was. Now, you know, in the Old Testament that Paul said, no, you know, it's a shame unto a man if you have long hair. But there's another part of this vow. First of all, no liquor, no grapes, or anything like that. Second, no razor on his head. <coughs> and thirdly, do not touch or even come near a dead person or a dead animal. Now, those were the three things. He was to be dedicated, separated unto God, and consecrated to God. Now, I want to say to you, but there's something we need to get a hold of, and you parents know this is true, that all that parents and pastors and teachers can do <coughs> Can I get a glass of water, please, uh, Zachary or Ben? Could you want you to get me a glass of water, please? <coughs> All that parents and pastors can do in the raising and in the dedication and the training of a child cannot negate that child's personal responsibility. Samson had been raised, as it were, in church. He had been given, quote, as it were, a Christian education. He had been told all the right things, taught all the right things. But you see, if you don't get it in here, you don't have it. Your daddy's faith and your mama's faith will never do you. My faith will never do you. What this church's faith is will never do you. It has to become personal to everyone or you don't have it. Doesn't make you notice what the rest of the kids are doing. It has to come to you personal and it had not come personal with Samson. I'm going to tell you, the ones that make the worst mess out of their life is the ones who've had the best raisin but have rejected it. That's the truth. You talk about a mangled mess. That's where the mangled mess you have a personal responsibility and choice in your salvation, whether you want to accept Jesus or not as your Savior. You have a choice in your repentance. You have a choice as to whether you want to live a separated life. You have a choice as to whether you want to serve the Lord. But it must become yours personally. And then let me say to you, even when you think that you have personally accepted and received the faith of Jesus Christ, then God will test that faith as to whether it's genuine and real in your heart. And that's good because then you'll know. It's not for Him to know. It's for you to find out whether you're real in your heart. Now, Samson's rebellious spirit, and by the way, that's what it was, was a rebellious spirit against God and against that which is right is revealed by several things. Number one, he had an excessive allurement to the world and evil. Now, I watch this church. I watch my own heart. I watch my kids. I watch my family. Thank you, son. I, I watch it. And I'm going to tell you something. How many here can tell when a young person in this church has an excessive allurement to worldly things? Raise your hand. Right, raise them up. Don't get in the game. I'm not going to do like Donnie did. I don't let you get by with it. Raise your hand if you can discern that someone has kind of got to eat. They're easily allured to worldliness. Raise your hand. Now, keep them raised because i got an exercise. Young people, look around you. If they can see it, do you not think that God sees it? He had an excessive allurement to the world and to evil. Secondly, he had an independent spirit. I don't have to do what my mom and dad says. I want the enjoyment of a home and family, but I don't want to have to do what my mom and dad says. And I want to be away from mom and dad. That was it. When he takes this journey away from his parents, wants to go on down the trail by himself, why does a young person want to get where mom and dad can't see him? What's the purpose of getting yourself into a situation or places 
where your mom and dad, where you don't feel comfortable with your mom and dad being around? Just ask yourself that question. And then I want you to, and the third thing is, he had a weakness of moral strength. That's shown. Fourthly, he had a lack of wisdom. He had a lack of understanding and a lack of character. And all of these things that are fruit of a rebellious spirit within him, the Bible says rebellion is a sin of witchcraft, they now have led him into a very dangerous and deadly situation where the lion, who is a type of Satan, come against him. And it's so often, I want you to listen to me, young people, if you don't get anything, young married person, some daddy who's being tempted by women, you listen to me carefully right now. So often in God's economy and God's dealing with his children, and it's consistent with God's character, God, when danger comes, gives a great deliverance, even though you've not been where you should have been and doing what you not what you should not have been doing. Did you understand? You were at a place where you shouldn't have been, doing things you shouldn't have, shouldn't have been do- doing, and you're totally out of the will of God. You have a rebellious spirit, and yet God miraculously delivers you from that circumstance. That's the pattern of God. I'm telling you, your Heavenly Father will reach down into a, to a sorry low-down beer joint. He'll reach into a dance hall. He'll reach into a car that's in a dark, dark place. He'll reach into a party somewhere and reach and get a hold of you and jerk you out of there and deliver you from being killed that night or ruined that night. Now I want to talk about this deliverance that God, God gave him because it wasn't Sam, Samson did not deliver himself. The Bible says the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. It was all of God's deliverance. God enabled him to get out of that mess. The first thing I want you to notice, I want to learn some lessons. That, I hope we can learn some lessons that Samson didn't learn. The first thing is the miracle of the deliverance. I said it wasn't an accident, and it wasn't his own strength or wisdom. The Bible is full of divine deliverances. Exodus, Pharaoh's army, Moses and the children of Israel were divinely delivered from Pharaoh at the Red Sea. David was delivered from Goliath and Israel from the Philistines. Hezekiah and Israel was delivered miraculously from Sennacherib and his invasion by the angel who killed 185,000. Esther and the Jews were delivered from wicked Haman. Elijah was delivered at Mount Carmel. Joseph was delivered in Egypt. Daniel was delivered out of the lion's den. Three Hebrew children were delivered out of the fiery furnace. And you go on, Peter was delivered out of prison. On and on and on, all through the Bible, there is a teaching that God miraculously delivers His children. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10 quickly, everybody. And if you don't have a Bible, get where you do, but do hold your place in the book of Judges. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, I want us to look at this passage of Scripture. You, I want you to understand something about deliverance because lost man, let me tell you something you need to hear. Lost woman, you have to be delivered by God or you'll never be delivered. And deliverance is what salvation is all about. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. I want you to look at, you talk about, now what's the number 10 in the Bible? What's number 10 related to? Testimony. The testimony of God. So here you are. In verse 10, God wants to give you and I a testimony of what He is and who He is. No, how many times is the word delivered or deliver in that verse? Read it. How many times? Three times. So now you have a testimony, number ten, of three times deliver. The testimony of three is the number of divine. So you have a testimony of divine what? Deliverance. Now, I want to show you God's divine deliverance in this verse. Look at it. In verse ten, who delivered us from so great a death? That is your salvation. So great a death. What is so great a death? It's your eternal damnation and separation from God in the lake of fire. When you get saved, God delivers you from so great a death. Amen. Let me tell you something. That is a great death for a man to die without Jesus Christ and split hell wide open and raise up his eyes and know that he's there and he's there forever. What a deliverance when Jesus died on the cross for you and I. That where sins can be washed to what's white as snow. That our sins can be remembered against us no more. And God delivered us from so great a death. I'll tell you our problem is we forget how great a deliverance Jesus Christ delivered us from. We get saved and then we grow a little bit and we think we've learned something in the Bible. And the first thing you know, we're sitting right out and cocky and smart and proud about our biblical knowledge. When all the time we've, got, we've forgotten the great deliverance God delivered us from. I tell you, we ought to be on our faces, not our chins up in the air. God delivered us from hell forever. Amen. I'll tell you something, but look at the second thing. And doth deliver. Now, after you get saved, God doesn't quit delivering you. Because as you're going along on your Christian journey, as Samson was, you get yourself in the devil's vineyard. You're taken around where you ought not to have been. 
and God still delivers. How many of you are Christians in here? And after you got saved, you got in the mud hole of sin, and God reached down and jerked you out. Raise your hand. Amen. You know what I'm talking about. That's the first, the first deliverance in that verse is talking about salvation. The second deliverance is talking about sanctification. But look at the next one. He said, and yet what? And we trust that He will yet deliver us. You know what that's talking about? He's going to deliver us out of the grave at resurrection, or if you haven't died yet, He'll deliver you out of this world by the rapture. So you have, that's your glorification. So the first deliverance is your salvation. Your second deliverance is your sanctification. Your third deliverance is your glorification when you get a new body like Jesus Christ had. Now that's good meat from the Word. And I don't care if you like it or don't like it. That's the Bible. Amen. I'll tell you, that's the whole, this, the Holy Ghost wrote this book. Amen. And so once you see the miracle of our deliverances, Jesus though was delivered for our offenses. Now I want you to not only see the miracle of the deliverance, but I want you to secondly see the mercy of the deliverance. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong attitude. Did you know he didn't deserve God's deliverance? How many times has it been the same way for you? I'll tell you, the devil would have killed you a long time ago like the lion would have killed Samson if it hadn't been for God's mercy. I'm going to tell you something. I wouldn't be in the ministry today still yet if it wasn't for God's mercy. Some of you sit back and you think, oh, well, Reggie, he, maybe he's just stouter spiritually. No, I'm not! I'm not stronger spiritually than anybody in this building. I often get on my face and, and, and get bow before God and say, God, I'd be in hell my, and I'd be out of the ministry and I'd be quit and I'd be done if it wasn't for your mercy. God, I've left my wife or left my children and my family or got messed up with immorality if it wasn't for your mercy. And if you don't think you're in that condition, you're in deception today. I'll tell you that whatever you are, you are by the grace of God. If you think you're something, you're fooled bad. Now, I'm in a little bit of a mean attitude today, so if I look mean while I preach, that's all right. Amen. I'll tell you something. I, sin is mean. The devil is wicked. He's cruel. He'll get you. But I thank God for His mercy. Amen. I'll lighten you up a little bit. Adam and Eve was laying on the side of the hill one day, enjoying the sunshine. They could even hear the flowers growing so fast. Going so fast. Eve reached over with her hand, and she started counting Adam's ribs. He laid there for a little bit, and he realized what was going on. He said, Eve, there is no other woman. Amen. Just needed to lighten you up a little bit. Amen. Titus chapter 3 says, According to His mercy, He hath saved us. You know why we got so many fake and phony converts sitting around churches in America? Because they walked up there and repeated some little prayer and shoot the preacher's hand, got baptized, and were taught a bunch of stuff. But they've never come to God as a broken sinner. I ought to go to hell. Oh, God, give me mercy. You've never been there. You ain't saved. And I don't care what your preacher told you. I don't care what you thought. You must have the mercy of God. Salvation is an act of mercy. You should have been burning in hell right now. You should have been screaming in the worms of hell right now. But God had mercy on you. I'm going to tell you something. When God delivers us and our families, I guarantee if our families grow up and our kids get saved and they wake it into heaven, it'll be because of the mercy of God, not because I was a good parent. Then thirdly, there's the misapplication of Samson's deliverance. And I want to park my car here for just a while. Because this is what happens to us. First of all, it was a miracle. Second of all, it was a mercy. But thirdly, here's where the problem comes. Sam Samson misapplied the deliverance. And boy, I'm telling you, this is where it's at. Now, you listen tight right now. Samson's deliverance. God's deliverance was not God vindicating what Samson was doing and where he was at. It was not God saying, Samson... It's okay if you be down here because whatever you do, I'm going to watch you out of and take care of you. You can go slop and swim in the sewer, the sewer pipes and send if you want to because I'll always be there to reach and get you out. And that's the message that Samson got out of it. You know what Samson did? He responded wrongly to the grace of God and he turned the grace of God into lasciviousness and a license to sin. Instead of the lesson he should have got was land sakes alive. It's a wonder I wasn't killed messing around down here on sin's road and the next time I better get out. But what he said, oh, bless God, I'm a Christian. I can go out and do whatever I want to. And that's a misapplication. He, Samson seemingly took it as having God's protection while walking in darkness. Samson seemingly misapplied this, e this early deliverance in his life as evidence that he could get by and get away with whatever he happened to decide to do in life. And I'm telling you, I have done that personally, and it's dangerous. And you, if you've lived very long in Christ, have done the same thing. I'm telling you today, there are probably people sitting in here that you've kept dabbling and God delivered you. And you say, like, dabble some more, God's delivered you. And you dabble some more in sin and God's delivered you. I'm going to tell you, there's going to come a place where God, you're going to wake up some morning with a hair cut off your head. And you're going to think God's still with you. And all of a sudden you realize God no longer has protected me. He's going to let me reap the wages of my sin. 
I'm telling you, listen, your sin will find you out. But instead of seeing it as a mercy, Samson saw it as a license it's to go deeper into sin. Instead of seeing it as a warning where his sinful life was taking him and his rebellion was taking him, he got so self-deceived that he decided sin's not very expensive. I can get away with it. He should have said to himself, I better get back to the narrow way. I better get back where I ought to be. I like to got it messing around over here to beer joint. I like to got it messing around over here to dance hall. So often we misapply God's mercies and deliverances as evidence that we can get by with violating the Word of God. Maybe it was a deliverance from immorality. You came that close to committing adultery. Maybe it was deliverance from debt. I mean, you came that close to busting yourself financially. Maybe it was that close to murder. Maybe you, I mean, you got so angry and so mad and so wicked that you would have killed somebody if the opportunity had presented itself. Maybe you came that close to you and your wife being divorced. Maybe you came that close to committing a crime and getting the penalty of that crime and you'd have been in Jeff City today instead of sitting here in church. Maybe there was some temptation. You came that close, but God reached out with mercy and pulled you back and you're in church this morning. To all of us, I say, let us not be deceived into believing that because God has delivered us from the lions in the midst of our disobedience that we can continue without judgment. I will give you a passage of Scripture. Listen to it very carefully in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 1. He that being often reproved and hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. God says, I want to tell you what I happened. He said, I want to do to you just what happened to Samson. You can tinker with my mercy. You can tinker with my goodness a long time. But there'll come a time you being often reproved I've reached out and kept you from ruining yourself. Reached out and kept you from ruining yourself. And you decide that you're going to use that for license to go on in your sin. And he says, I'll tell you what I'll do. He says, I'll just pull my hand back. And I said, I'll let the devil nail your hide. Does the Bible not even say that in taking communion, that because people will not examine themselves, because they will not get honest with you, he said, many are sick among you, many are weak. And he said, some even sleep. And he's talking about they died because they wouldn't get honest and repent of their sin. And they took unworthily the blood of, and the, uh, took unworthily the juice and the bread is representation of the body and blood of Jesus Christ and, damnated, and put damnation on their own life. Then there's the message of the re- re- deliverance. What was the message God wanted him to get out of the deliverance? One word. Repent. There was a message that God wanted Samson to get out of this situation. Samson, turn from where you're headed. Samson, stop it. Samson, stop it. Get back where you need to be. But you see, the mercy of God does not lead Samson to repentance. Turn to your Bibles to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Just turn back a few pages from 2 Corinthians. To Romans chapter 2. I want every person in this building today to read this passage of Scripture. There's an old saying. I've had people come up to me and say, Brother Reggie, I have a child. And and this one loves the Lord. Seems like wants to do right. I've got another one over here. Seems like if he can just find whatever's wrong to do, that's what they want to do. Why? I'll tell you why. Because of the heart condition of that child. The same sun, listen to me, the same sun that melts the snow hardens the clay. The same sun that melts the snow will harden the clay. You can bring two kids in this church house to your family. And one will sit there in the sunlight of God's truth and God's love and God's mercy and God's grace will just tenderize that heart and they will just absolutely, after the snow, the green will come forth in their life. But the other child, it will just bake them hard as a rock and they leave this church and get out here and they don't want anything to do with Christianity. It has just hardened because of the condition of the heart. You look at Romans chapter 2, verse 4 and 5 with me. Verse 4 and 5. Or despisest thou the riches... And it's talking about God's riches of goodness and forbearance. Well, the three things God said you can despise. You despise thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering. Did you notice what Samson did, young people? Daddy, mama, grandparents. Samson despised the goodness of God, the forbearance of God, the long suffering of God. So I can go back down and tinker with the same old slop hole again. Not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Wasn't it good of God to give him strength to destroy that line, to deliver him? That was good of God, wasn't it? And didn't God put up with him? Wasn't God good to him and forbore with him and God suffered long with him? But you know what he said? He despised him. And he didn't know that it was the goodness of God trying to lead him to repentance. Oh, dear Samson, dear son, it wasn't God telling you you could go out and do what you wanted to do and how slick you was and how you could get by with it. That God wasn't telling you that at all. God was telling you, listen... Turn from it, Samson, before it gets you in trouble. I'm amazed at what sits in church houses, behind the pulpits, 
and in the pews, the sin and the worldliness and the rot and the garbage that goes on. It amazes me. Look what it said. And going to church, and going to church every Sunday and the goodness and the forbearance of God, not knowing the goodness of God, look at verse 5. But after thy what? An impenitent what? What kind of heart? Do you know why? It's the condition of the heart that determines the response. And he says this person here had a hard and impenitent heart. They would not repent. Treasures up. You know what Samson did? Samson kept tinkering. And he was treasuring up the wrath of God. Because you see, of whom much is given, much is required. Do you know who the hottest spot in hell is for? Listen to me. Do you know who the hottest place in hell is for? Oh, it's not the sodomite down the San Francisco road today. It's not that beer drinking fornicator up for somewhere to bar, sitting on a bar stool this afternoon. It's that person who knew the truth and knew right. I'm going to tell you something. You can sit here in this church house today and you've heard more truth than the average person in America has heard. And you know that's the truth. And you sit here in this church house and you reject it and reject it and reject it and reject it. You tell me that God, let me tell you something, you're worse than all sodomites put together. You knew the truth and, re and rejected it and turned from it. I'm going to ask you something. Have you ever been born again? You've heard it, you've heard it, you've heard it, you've heard it. You've heard it, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. But you sit there and you sit there and you sit there and you're hard and you're impenitent. And I'm going to tell you something you're doing. This is not my opinion. This is the Word of God. You are treasuring up to yourself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. But Samson didn't get the message of the deliverance. You know what he said? And I've said this. Our hearts are so full of pride, it's not even funny. Samson said, I'm different than the rest of them. I can get by. I'm slicker. You ever said that? You heard about the, oh, you saw somebody get killed in a drunken car wreck. You heard about somebody, I mean, getting messed up and all kinds. But not me, I'm too slick. That's what Bill Clinton, that's why Arkansas is called him Slick Willie. He's not out of the fish yet. He may think he got away from man's judgment. He's not out of the fish yet, dear friend. Then there's the, the final thing about this deliverance I want to give you, and we're going to get into me, the message now, is the muteness about his deliverance. What do you mean by muteness, Reggie? I mean the silence. Did you notice something? Both times, when he, watch this, when he killed the lion, I'll tell you one thing, if I'd been 15, 20 years old and I'd been out hunting and I'd have killed a lion, I'd have come, Daddy, 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 come get in the truck, I killed a lion! In fact, I use if I just killed a button buck. Mom, Mom, come look. We kill a buck deer. We throw the back tail. I never could forget. Can't hold them things in a truck without the... You have to have a tailgate down for a buck deer. Put that thing in. I mean, if we kill a turkey, we got the head up over the back of the truck. I mean, <laughs> we drive all over the country till the meat rots. Wanting everybody to know we killed a deer. Samson kills a lion with his own bare hands, but does not even tell his own mom and daddy. Then he goes back and gets honey out of that lion's carcass, takes it to his mom and daddy, but does not tell them. Why didn't he tell them? He was defiled. Broke his Nazarite vow. And let me tell you something, he was unclean. And if he'd have told them, they would have shut down the marriage. And he knew it. And he got himself in the same trap that you kids would get yourself in. Once you go out and mess around and defile yourself, he's got you, isn't he? Can't talk to mom and dad about that. Can't talk to mom and dad about that. Gotcha. See, that's how Satan works, isn't it? He gets you to defile yourself with something that was forbidden. And once he does, you can't even have the pleasure of sharing it with those you love. Because it's defiling. He told not his father or mother what he had done. Somebody said that was modesty. He just wasn't going to want to brag about it. No, it wasn't. It was mutinous. Silence because of sin. Why the silence? Samson, I talked to Samson about this and he told me. He said the same reason that uh, some folks don't brag about winning a lottery ticket in the church house on Sunday night and get up and testify about it. <clears throat> he said the same reason some folks don't testify how big the fish was they caught while they was missing church. He said the same reason folks don't get up and testify what a good time they had down there at uh, Slick Willie's at, at Branson while there's church going on. He said, when you're out defiling yourself, you just don't have a tendency to come up and tell mom and dad in the church house what you're doing. Because why? Because he said he defiles you. He had contact with a dead animal, and that was part of his Nazarite vow. 
from his birth to his death, the Bible said, and he was unclean at least until evening. You say, well, now, doggone it, wait a minute, Reggie. He was just walking down through there, and this lion comes out at him, and the Spirit of God come up on him, and he killed him. How can he be accountable for that? I'm going to tell you how. He wasn't supposed to be there to start with. He was not where he's supposed to be. He was guilty. It's just like the guy who says, I was just driving a car while they robbed the bank. I didn't go in the bank. I didn't hold the gun. I just drove the car. You're not where you're supposed to be. You're guilty by association. If he had not been where he was not supposed to be, the lion wouldn't have, he wouldn't have had trouble with the lion. You see, if he told his parents, it would have affected the marriage arrangement. He was defiled and he knew it. He didn't want his parents to know. He didn't want the secret out because it would have hindered his plans and his pleasures. So from last week to today, we've seen the pathway of the rebel. We said last week the pathway is down, it's devious, it's dangerous, destructive, but God will give us deliverance. But if we don't pay attention to the deliverance, I want to go ahead and preach on the delusion of it. And that leads me to the pleasures of the rebel. Look at verse 8 and 9 in Judges chapter 14. <clears throat> it says that he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. Behold, a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. He took the in his hands and went on eating and came to his father and his mother and gave them and they did eat and he told them not what he, that he'd taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. You know, it's always amazed me how the devil can convince people that God didn't want them to have pleasure out of life. Now, I want to tell you something. This message is coming deep, deep, deep out of my heart. been working on it now for a couple of weeks. And I used to be a boy sitting in church house. Some of you don't believe that. I did. I used to be a boy and I knew right from wrong. My mom and dad sitting right here and they did teach me right from wrong. And I used to be a boy sitting probably Ben's age in the church house. And, and you know, I kind of like looked at girls. In fact, I can't hardly remember back when I didn't like to look at the girls. Any of you other boys like that? I don't even know. There's a lot. I'm just being honest about it. Hey, praise God I wasn't looking at the boys. Amen. <laughs> Amen. But I'm going to tell you something. There's a thought occurred to me because on occasion at Bible camp or somewhere out here preaching, uh, you know, and somehow or another boy got it in my head, you know, well, if God created Adam, God created Eve, and, you know, He gives this natural desire, and, you know, and you just feel this desire, you know, to be with girls, and what's so wrong about it? You ever think that way? Maybe you didn't. I did. Now, I'm going to tell you something. That I've, I learned something out of this and saw something clearer than I've ever saw in my life, how Satan operates. Let me tell you, young people of this church, from the back to the front, listen to me carefully. God is not against you having pleasure. My wife's favorite verse, if not her favorite verse, one of her favorite verses is Psalm 1611. And it says this. Thou, talking about God, listen to it very carefully. It meant more to me this week than it's ever meant. Thou will show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand, and keep this in mind later on the message, at thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. Now I want you to contrast that verse with Hebrews 11.5. Talking about Moses, who chose to suffer the affliction of God's people rather to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now watch the two contrasts. God says, my pleasure that I give you will last forevermore. Satan's pleasure he gives you will last for a season. Satan knows that you were designed to have pleasure. Hey, don't tell me that Adam didn't wake up and see Eve. Think that wasn't a good deal. Who designed man and woman? The devil sure didn't. Who created you like you are? The natural desires that a man or a woman has, who created them and who gave you those? Now, here's the secret. Satan, watch this, wants to give you some honey or pleasure, but he wants to give it to you out of the dead carcass of a lion. Okay, just hang on to that. Pleasure is a God-given desire. Satan plays on it. God gave Adam and Eve to each other. God gave us the earth and the fullness thereof. He gave us eternal life. That's a pleasure. He gave us the forgiveness of our sins. That's a pleasure. He gave us our families. That's a pleasure. He gave us our relationships. That's a pleasure. He gave us the church. That's a pleasure. He gave us our children. That's a pleasure. He gave us the seasons, the animals, the fish, and the birds, and the wildlife, and the plant life. And I don't know if anything more pleasurable walking out in the garden and picking tomatoes and ripe corn. 
righteousness. But I don't know anything sweeter than I, that I've lifted up a, a beehive and look in there and honey just oozing pert near out of them cones. God has given all kinds of things to pleasure. I mean, don't you like those old buns with butter melting down inside them? Don't you like them fried potatoes with onions? Down the, I mean, have you walk in the house and smell that good food? Amen. I'm going to have to preach fast now. Amen. Now, the problem with this is that the pleasures of the rebel, it is defiled pleasure. Now, I need two volunteers, and I don't want to use him. I've used him every Sunday, and I'm done for a while. Come on, Don. Let's go. Oh, no. This is a new jar of honey, and I can't... Okay. Now, I'm not going to have you to eat a whole piece of bread because I don't want it to last that long. Brand new jar, right? Brand new jar of honey. How many here like honey? Most people like honey. The Bible says, you know what the Bible says about honey? It's good. In fact, the Bible commands you to eat it and the honeycomb. It really does. I don't have your honeycomb, Don. I'm sorry. Okay. Zachary? You don't have to eat it all, but you need to eat some of it. Don, yours is coming next. I ain't going to let you eat it, Don. Oh. You know what I did to that? Oh, I just thought he did that. I didn't think he really did it. I really did. Oh, man. I'm gone. <laughs> now, let me tell you something. Zach, is that good? Let me try. <laughs> That's some water right there. Ain't saying what's wrong with that honey he's eating. But this honey here, what's wrong with it? He filed. But did you know what I could have really given that to him? He wouldn't have known it. Have you wondered how many places at dinner you bought out a restaurant somebody spit in it for you? <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. Nobody's going to eat today. Amen. But you know why I can't? Now, he could have ate it, but it was defiled. And this is what God doesn't want you. This, this, please get a hold of this. And Don, what if Don says, well, I want it. I I'm going to eat it. And he starts grabbing out my hand on trying to say, no, Don, it's defiled. It's got spit in it. And spit is an indication in the Bible of awful defilement. They would, the, 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 the man with lep leprosy would spit so you wouldn't come there. They spit on the place where he sat because they didn't want anybody sitting there. It's defiled. Now, here's the difference. Satan will take his the pleasures that were naturally designed for your good, your enjoyment, your blessing, and he spits in it. And then he hands it to you. And you take in, and then you're defiled. And I want to tell you, this is the, the great lesson out of this thing. And Don and Zachary, thank you so much. I appreciate it. You helped me out to illustrate that. I will say that I was tempted. <laughs> to give it to him. <clears throat> Let me ask you a question. Is God against honey? No, he's not. Proverbs 24, 13 says it's good. What was wrong? The honey was defiled. It was taken from the... In Samson's case, the honey was taken from where? The dead carcass of the lion. Is, no, <clears throat> listen to me carefully. Is God against marriage? It's what? Honey. Why do you call each other honey? Is God against pleasure? Is God against physical... Listen, young people, listen to this preacher. Is God against physical intimacy? No. He's just against defiled physical intimacy. Whether that be fornication, adultery, sodomy, bestiality, take your pick. Satan's got a lot of things he spits on before he gives it to you. And by the way, it's forbidden of God. God says, don't you get near it. Don't you touch it. Don't you eat of it. Was God against Samson having a wife? No. Think about this. This is wild. Samson wants a Philistine honey against the commandments of God. He wanted a defiled honey, literally. And when he went down through the vineyard, he got defiled. God was sending Samson a message early. You are about to eat defiled honey. Stay away from it. But what did he do? He reached in knowing 
that he wasn't even to be around a dead carcass like that and took his hands in that old carcass of that day. I can see the cockroaches and the bugs crawling and you say, well, that wouldn't be where bees are. Oh, yes, it is. Open up a beehive and there'll be every kind of bug running out of there you've ever seen if you're not careful. And he reaches in that old dead stinking carcass of that line and reaches and gets his hands full of honey and he starts eating that defiled honey. And then he takes it to his mom and dad. The problem is mom and dad don't know where it came from and I'll talk to that, about that a little bit later. Is God against you having pleasure? No, unless it's defiled pleasure. It's one of the most clear pictures of how the devil operates. He puts something natural, something good, something you want, something that you desire, something that's pleasurable, something that's enjoyable and even good for you in a place and a position so that you have to defile yourself to get it to fulfill your desire. We watch the TV to watch a good ball game or something that we think is basically good but we defile ourselves with the previews or advertisements for a small part of the picture. Or we have to lie just a little to get the financial deal made that we wanted. That which is good. God's not against you making a living. God's not against you making money. God just don't want you to defile yourself while you're doing it. On with or keep silence about something to keep from losing your friends or your finances. To get a good meal, we've got to go in a bar to get it nowadays. To get a vote or support, we compromise a truth or a conviction. To get an education or a degree, the honey... We defile ourselves and our minds and our hearts with the false philosophies, the carcass. You can never, listen to me, you can never get the devil's honey from any place outside the devil's carcass. Trappers know the principle. I want you to see the old fox. He sees the honey. And he circles that trap. And he walks up with his nose. Now, I want to tell you something about God is shown in nature. I do not know a fox or a coon or a bobcat that somehow or another when they're at a trap situation, there's something in them that tells them there's something wrong. You ever watch them? They'll just ease around that thing and walk around that thing and they'll just ease around that thing. And they, you know what's going on with them? There's a war between the flesh and the spirit. They lust for the honey, but they also have inner warnings and cautions of danger and death. Your flesh will look and will lust and then watch it. It will reason and rationalize. I'm smart enough to get it out of the trap without getting trapped. Mm -hmm. You think you can commit those sins without the trap closing on you. In fact, did you know there are a few foxes and bobcats that have an incredible ability to snatch the bait out without getting in the trap? I mean, cows have learned how to do that. Coons have learned how to do it. Spring the trap and get the bait. You see, it's the old idea. We want to know how to enjoy our sin and get by with it. But your spirit will warn you and caution you. Your flesh, it will send, it'll flash danger signals to you. It's going to sting you. It's going to bite you. It's going to trap you. It's going to kill you. And as I said, the devil always puts his honey in a dead, defiling carcass. Now, here's the picture. You're going to have to defile yourself or disobey the Word of God, either in letter and spirit, to get the devil's honey. And then when you do, you're trapped and separated from God ordained authority in your life. Now, if I had a deal up here and we put honey on one side... And the, and the carcass on the other, you think about this. The honey of something we want to purchase. House, car, land, refrigerator. Don't make it here. The honey of something we want to purchase. Mm, mm, we'd like to have it. But you've got to get it out of the carcass of a debt note. Watch the principle work. We want the honey of a wife or a companion or a lover, boys. But we get it out of the carcass of essential hell cat that we didn't know we married. We want the honey of immorality and the satisfying of the flesh, but we have to get it out of the carcass of shame and disgrace or maybe a venereal disease or a broken home or a lost family. Watch this one. We get the honey of a baby out of wedlock, the carcass. Out of the carcass of out of wedlock. We can even get the honey of false doctrine that pleases the flesh, but it's out of the carcass of eternal damnation. We can get the honey of false freedom. In other words, I get to do what I want to. But we get it out of the carcass of bondage and spiritual, mental, and physical psychological breakdowns and become a slave of sin. We may want the honey of personal hobbies and pleasures and neglect our families, but we'll wind up getting it out of the dead carcass of a dead marriage and a dead home. We may want the honey of material gain and money and things that money can buy, but we'll 
get it out of the dead carcass of dead relationships and broken relationships and vanity of life. We may want the honey of unhealthy living habits, smoking and drinking and overeating, but we'll get it out of the carcass of a sick body. We may want the honey of easy money, but we'll get it out of the carcass of a gambling casino or lotto. We may want the honey of unjust gain, but we'll get it out of the carcass of a defiled conscience. We may want the honey, girls, of attention and security of a young man, but you'll get it out of the carcass of a two-bit religious fake of a man. You may want the honey of temporal causes and have the carcass of an empty life. You may want the honey of power and position, but you'll get it out of the carcass of a ruined life. You may even want the honey of ease, but you'll get it out of the carcass of boredom. And you may want the honey of popularity, but you'll usually find it at the carcass of compromise. But God's honey never defiles. You can get pleasure without being defiled. And there are no traps with God's honey. And there is no guilt. And there is no sting. The polluting of the rebel. And we finish today with this. He gave the defiled honey to his parents. What is the goal of rebels and sinners? They are never content to do evil alone. There is always somehow a motivation to involve and pollute other people with their sin. You ever notice that? People that drink never want to drink alone. People that do drugs never want to do drugs alone. And people who are immoral are always trying to get somebody involved in immorality. Samson never told his parents that the honey was defiled. He thus lied to them by his silence. And he knew they wouldn't eat it if he told them. But look at this. If his mom and listen, if he can get his mom and dad to eat it, it justifies what he has done. They ate it too. And I watched this and I said something. You want to watch this. I know you kids are all angels and got halos and wings on you. But I know my own heart. There's nothing in the world that can cause you to feel more justified about your sin than getting your mom and dad to lower their standards. In most homes, there is a constant battle. If there's any rebellion at all, trying to get mom and dad to lower their standards and partake of the defilement. So the child then has his mom and dad under a leverage and says, well, you did it too. Isn't it amazing how we try to drag parents into accepting what we know they taught us is wrong? But I want to say this to the parents out here today. Did you know the real core of this thing began with mom and dad? Because there was a place back last week in the Scripture... Well, they argued with him, but they went ahead with it. And I'm going to tell you where they made the mistake, and don't ever forget this, Daddy. If Samson's dad would have said, Samson, you're our son and we love you, and you're going the wrong direction, and you're going to marry a guy we're not approve of, if you do it, you'll do it on your own, not with our approval. They didn't have to go down there with him. They could have said, Samson, if you walk that path, you'll walk it alone. But I'm not going to sanction it by going down there and getting you that wife. How many in here think that Samson might have been a lot better off if his dad would have took a stand way back up here at the house? Amen. Can I encourage you, daddies, that sometimes you don't want to make enemy out of your own child? You like to have good relationships with your own children, but take a stand, keep taking a stand. Sometimes it's hard to stand with your own children. When they're wanting, they're wanting, you know, and it seems so rational, and you, and you think, well, doggone it, you know, I mean, uh. I mean, it's not always easy to answer those things. The goal of the rebel is to get other people involved so they can justify their own sin. That's the goal of companies that advertise all this stuff, isn't it? Get them involved. And then there's the guy. He told them not that he had taken the the honey out of the carcass. You bet he didn't tell them. You know, if the devil in the world told you what he was going to get after you eat their honey, you wouldn't eat their honey. Just exactly like Don Zinn, once he really knew, he thought I had just faked it, I guess. But once he found out there was true spit on that bread, he didn't want nothing to do with it. I'm going to tell you something. If you really knew what was in the honey that the devil's feeding you, you wouldn't eat of it. Isn't it amazing that a, that a beer, beer commercial, I mean, always showing, I mean, some good looking, I mean, just perfectly built woman. I never have seen them, you 60 and 70 year old women that's had six or seven kids to sell beer with yet, have you? I never have. They'll have some woman up there that's going to slit up her dress and she's stretched out and she's got her arms slung over some old boy and he's a good-looking muscular thing and he might have three women wrapped around his neck and he's drinking Curves Light and Bud Light and they put that out there. And they, what is the message? If you drink Bud Light, boys, there might be three or four girls hugging you around the neck and start kissing on you. 
Can I tell you this? It's just like the, the Palestinians do, the, the Shiite rebels do, the Islamics do with their boys. You know what? If you were a, a, a Shiite rebel, you know what you do? I say, Luke, you go strap a bomb around yourself. You go down there to the Israelis and blow yourself up at the market. But when you get blowed up, you'll go into heaven and there'll be 70 virgins waiting on you, Luke. That's exactly what they tell them. That's why if you let yourself be deceived like that. Oh, see, they use the what? The devil's honey. But it's out of a dead carcass of deceit and death. Why is it to, I mean, why is it that nobody tells the truth? Why don't they have beer commercials that shows a, a, a car wreck over here and some kid's head sticking out from underneath an upside down turned car? And why don't they show the four boys up there, north of Mansfield, north of Hartville, crunched up in that car and they're groaning in there and their mom and dads are screaming outside and there's beer cans and beer everywhere? Why don't they show the person who's vomiting and choking on the, why don't they show Bon, bon Scott with ABCD would make a wonderful beer commercial? Yeah. <laughs> Laying beside a a bed, choking to death on his own stinking vomit. Why don't they show that? Because, no, no, it's defiled, honey, and it'll kill you. And they know if they showed you the truth, you wouldn't drink the stupid stuff. Why is that dope head that drives around that good car or drives around the square and and peddling his dope around Mountain Grove and Norwood, walking up and down the school halls and peddling their dope and their garbage starting you out on marijuana and then getting you on something else and you girls better stay away from that junk or the first thing you know you'll be drinking ecstasy and they'll have your clothes off you in the backseat of a car and you won't even know how many men have already had you. If you don't like that kind of straight preaching, find you a little liberal place that'll patty you all the way to hell. But I'm going to tell you something that's happening all over this country. And our preachers are setting the pulpits won't warn people, won't call it as it is. And by the way, may I say school teachers sitting in the seats and board members and bus drivers and cooks. And they wouldn't dare expose the truth because they don't want anybody to know the defilement that's in their honey. You know what their honey is? Money. My little job at the school, you can take this tape and give it to all of them if you like. I don't care. You tell me how many people, how many young people died in this country coming up from the creek party. Yeah. Girl coming into her mother's house up north of Mountain Grove about one o'clock in the morning. She heard her come in and all of a sudden she heard her start screaming. She went in the bathroom and her daughter's hanging over the seat screaming. Oh, my God, I don't know what they gave me. Down here at the creek party on Fox Creek. And all night long, worked with that daughter trying to save her life. Still don't know what they gave her at the party. Fine. Samson. You see, we're not done with Samson yet. Pretty soon Samson's going to have his eyes. By the way, if you look, you read, check it out. His, they're bored out. Yeah. Grinding at the Philistines' mill. It's not a funny thing. The guile of it. Cigarette companies. Riding horses and hoopy lawn. Why don't they, show, why don't they go up here to the hospital? And show the whole ward of fair people. Why <laughs> don't they show the beer gutted, Bob died, cancerous lung crowd? Why don't they pull somebody's chest open and show his lungs ate up with cancer from sucking on them cigarettes all his life long? Why don't they show that dad coming in the beer company kicking his wife in the guts while he comes in drunk some night? Why don't they show him taking that child and taking, slamming him against the wall? Why don't they show that sin crazed dad picking his child up knocking him up the head knocking him all over the house and his wife screaming don't, don't, don't we're the lionest hypocritical bunch of people that ever walked on the face of the earth Americans are why don't they show what you do with that burn them kids with cigarette butts why don't they show that nasty filthy hideous pervert taking his own daughters and taking the clothes off of her and molesting his own daughter crazed with drugs and drink demonism I'm going to tell you something. The devil's honey is all over this country and it's defiled as it can be. And I'm not, listen, I know I ain't preaching to everybody out there. But I'm preaching here, but I'm accountable to this crowd. I'm accountable to this flock. The Bible teaches us there's two places. Now, I want to say one last thing about defiled honey. I'll tell you some of the worst defiled honey, and I know we've been through it all week long with Brother Mike up here, but these preachers going off to Bible college and reaching into the defiled carcass of a, quote, Bible college to get the honey that they're to take back to their flock. And they get back there and it's defiled honey that's coming across in their pulpits. And everybody just lapping it up. 
and all over this country, and I don't care what denominational group your mom or daddy or your Uncle Joe's with, Baptists, Pentecostals, Methodists, Nazarenes, Presbyterians, go right down the line, are all departing from the King James Bible. I didn't say they all were, but I want to tell you something, they're, 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 most of their leaders are. Assembly of God, don't make any difference, you name it, and they're departing from it. Now, you do have some men of God who are fighting, who are staying in there, who are trying to, but I'm telling you, they're all, they're all laced with it. And I saw a picture here. I saw a young man. I saw Samson as a young preacher boy going down to the dead carcass of the Bible college, reaching in and getting that defiled doctrine. And he's going to bring back to his home place. And he's going to pour that defiled honey out to his people. Turn your Bibles to Psalms 81 and I'm done. Young people, there's two places you can get honey out of life. I would challenge you today to get it out of the right place. Psalms 81. Let's begin with verse 10. I am the Lord thy God which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. If you want to take that typology, that's talking about I'm the Lord that saved you. Brought you out of the world of sin and wickedness. Open thy mouth wide and I will fill it. I know that's most Dennis' favorite verse. Verse 11. But my people would not hearken to my voice and Israel would none of me. Watch verse 12. This is what happened to Samson. So I gave them up unto their own heart's lust and they walked in their own counsels. Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me, and Israel had walked in my ways. I should, have soon, I should soon have subdued their enemies and turned my hand against their adversaries. The haters of the Lord should have submitted themselves unto him, but their time should have endured forever. He should have fed them also with the finest of the wheat and with honey out of the rock. Should I have satisfied thee? I want to close today in saying this. There's two places that you're going to get the honey of life. One's going to be either out of the carcass of the devil or you're going to get it out of the rock of ages. You'll get your honey out of the carcass of the devil, the fire, or you'll get your honey out of the rock of ages. Where are you going to get your honey at today? Oh, I want to tell you something. I want to tell you. I want to tell you kids something. Please listen to me. If I, if I was dead before next Sunday, come in bed, don't forget out God's good. Kids, Alan, God is good. He's not cheating you out of life. Amen. There's anything I know about God, God's good. Right. Young people, God's not cruel to you. God's not mean to you. God's not trying to cheat you. He's just trying to keep you from eating the filed honey. Amen. And He's saying to you this, I know, I designed you to have pleasure, to have enjoyment, to have blessing. I want to bless you. But get your honey out of the rock. I could show you in the Bible where it says, Thy words were sweeter unto me than honey. The Bible compares Scripture to honey. What's it saying? The wisdom, the truth, the principles, the statutes, the judgment of God are the honey that can flow into your life and give you a life that's worth living. I want to ask a question as I close today. Where are you folks getting your honey? Where are you folks getting your honey? And where are you folks getting your honey? And I want to ask you today this question. Are you saved? Are you saved? Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Boy, I'm telling you, I, when I, I saw this thing, I'm going to tell you all something. Oh, man. Did you know that it's possible, and I've done it, to take this passage of Scripture and turn it completely flip-flop and preach it as if Samson had wrought a great spiritual victory? It is. I preached a message one time entitled, Killing Lions and Eating Honey. It was on the radio broadcast. I had requests from tapes, even as far as Lebanon people called up one those tapes and did not know I was preaching false doctrine. Now, I will say that there are some types of Christ in this thing, but the basic primary message of this thing is not Samson walking spiritually with God. It's a lesson of disobedience to God's Word because the whole key to understanding this thing was he obeying the Word of God. No, he was not. Let's bow our heads. As our heads are bowed and eyes closed this morning, as the pianist comes and the song leader, where are you getting your honey at this morning? I want to ask you, are you walking this morning in the vineyards of Tim Nath? Young people, are you trying to get your honey out of the carcass of the devil? Mom and Daddy, maybe there's a dad in here, you're trying to get your honey out of the carcass of the devil and it's defiling you and everybody around you. Mama, 
wife, look, listen to me, are you getting your honey out of the carcass of the devil? And it's defiling you and defiling everybody around you. Young people, listen to me. I'm going to say this to you. She's going to start playing in just a minute. And when she hits that pianist, when she hits that organ, and if you've been in, you say, Oh, God spoke to my heart today. I need to do what Samson didn't do. I need to get out of the vineyard of Timnath. I need to get back on the straight and narrow way. I need to get my hands washed of this stinking devil's honey. And I need to get my life cleaned up with God. I want you to come out of that seat right now. Right now. Come on. The Holy Ghost has spoke to you right now. And you say, Reggie, I need to get back where I need to be on the path of God. You come on. God bless you, young man. Bless your heart. Come on, quickly. Somebody else this morning. Maybe a dad. Maybe a mother this morning. Quickly, while the Holy Ghost of God deals with you. I need to get back on the path with God. I'm tinkering around the vineyards of Tim now. I'm going down where the devil's honey is. I'm trying to get the satisfaction of pleasures of life out of the devil's way, and it's not working. I'm, I, no wonder I feel defiled. No wonder I feel unclean. No wonder I don't feel right inside. Come on, come on, while the Holy Ghost is dealing with you. God bless you for your honesty. Come on, quickly. Quickly this morning. Let, let the Holy Ghost have His way. Let the Holy Ghost have His way. Listen, we ain't fooling nobody. Listen, I know what that battle is. I know what that struggle is. You think the devil doesn't try to tempt you or preach you're crazy in a bed bug? Come on this morning. Come on, right quick. While the Holy Ghost of God's dealing with you, God has sent these messages on Samson for such a time as this. There are some young people in here who are just like Samson. God wants the best of your life, and the devil's trying to lead you down to eat him. He knows that you need honey. He knows that you need that, that what God's designed you, but he's trying to get you to fulfill it another way. Come on. Others come quickly. I'll just feel the front of this church this morning. People get right and get honest with God. Get out of that place. Get out of that place. Move quickly. Get away from that little carcass of that old dead line. You're watching some movies you know you ought not be watching. You're going some places you know you ought not be going. You're li- reading some literature you know you ought not be reading. Come on this morning. Come on quickly. While the Holy Ghost visits this place today, I want to ask you a question. Our heads are bowed. You come ahead. If the Holy Ghost deals with you, draws you, you come on. But let me ask you a question today. How many people in this church house say, I'm saved by the grace of God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ? I've, I've come to God in repentance of sin and faith in Jesus. And I received Him as my Savior. And God saved me and made me His child. And I know if I had to die today, I'd be in heaven. Would you slip your hand up right now and say, Dear God, thank you for saving me, a wretch that ought to have been in hell. God bless you. you may put them down. How many say, Reggie, today I could not raise my hand. I'm headed to hell. And I don't want to go to hell. And I don't know much about it, but I want Christ as my Savior today, and I want to believe on Him. Pray for me. Would you slip your hand up real high where I can see it today? Slip your hand up right now. I don't want to die and go to hell. I don't want to die and go to hell, and I need to be saved today. Come on, friend. Come on, friend. Don't turn from the one who suffered for you and died for you and loves you with an eternal love. Who's the only, play, only one that can keep you out of the pits of hell. Would you slip your hand up and say, pray for me? Now, I'm not coming back to you. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I'm going to tell you something. Somebody needs to pray for you. Would you slip your hand up this morning and say, pray for me? I'm lost. I'm without God. I'm lost without God. Headed to hell this morning. I'm like Samson. Headed down to lion's death. Would you come on right now? Slip your hand up. Anywhere in this building. I'm lost. Pray for me. Pray for me. I'm lost today. Anybody in this building? Anybody in this building care about your soul today? You're on the road to hell and you sure don't want to go there and you at least like somebody to pray for you. I don't see a hand in this building, but I don't believe everybody in here is saved either. But I want to tell you, is there anybody else? You need to come today. You need to get out of that path of the line today. You need to quit eating that defiled honey. You need to get right with God today. You need to have a clean heart. To start out with devotion this morning, create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. There's room at the cross for you. Donnie, I'm going to ask you to come pray with Sammy, would you? Someone else this morning need to come while the Holy Spirit's dealing with you. Now, let me, let me just, I want to talk to you for just a minute. Listen to me carefully. Young people, listen sharp. Listen sharp. I'm not done. You're this morning here, and you may have come to the front of this church and got some things right with God, but you don't have things right with your mom and daddy. And I'm not saying that you've got to go spill the guts on everything you've done or been, but you ought at least, it, to, get, to really get right, to really get right, you ought to go to your mom and dad and say, Dear mom and dad, I've, I've let the devil separate me from you. Just there's a barrier there and I just can't seem. And I don't want it to be that way. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not living with that. Dear mom and dad, I love you. And I just want you to know I'm back where I ought to be with you this morning. And I want to stay in touch with you. I want to stay in touch with you. You say you've not been where you ought to be. And you know it's that way. You know it's that way. Why don't you go to your mom and dad this morning and say, Mom and dad, oh, I tell you, the devil's tempted me off the paths of Tim Nath and I need to get back right. He said, oh, don't ask us to do that, Brother Reggie. Yes, I do. You know why? I know you'll know the truth. The truth will set you free. And if you don't, you'll leave this place in bondage. 
you'll leave this place in bondage. Why don't you do that right now? Just wherever you're at. Go to your mom and dad if you need to. Mom and dad have not been walking where I need to be walking. Not been doing what I need to be doing. And I want you to know I've made it right with God this morning. And pray for me. And let's, let's stay in contact. Why don't you do that right now? Anybody in this building got the guts, got the backbone, got the courage, got the love of God in them enough to do that? Just right now. Just have, just have that courage. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, young man. God bless you, young lady. But I want to tell you something. God will heal our homes. God will heal our homes. God will heal our homes. You know, it's not the words we say. It's just coming back where we ought to be, under that protection of mom and dad, under that protection of the parent, parental authority God gave. There's others this morning. You need to go to your parents. Come on. Come on this morning. Just, just do it. Just talk to them right now. Come on. You know what I noticed? I noticed something that Ronnie Simpson said a long time ago. I, I remember him saying he said, it's always the best Christians that get right the firstest. Would you, would you move right now? Would you let the Holy Spirit, the devil separated you from your mother and your dad this morning, would you just let the Holy Spirit heal? You see, if you walk out of here and he, he, he said, well, get it right, God, but you know, don't get it right, Mom and Dad. He knows he's still got bondage on you. Your hands are still defiled. Could you do that this morning? Could you go to Mom and Dad? Lord, I don't know what else to do this morning. I don't know anything else to do. Lord, if I knew, if I was led by the Spirit to do anything else, I'd do it right now. But I I just don't know any more to do. And so, Father, we commit this message, this service to you. We commit these families to you, these homes, these individuals. I'm praying, God, that your Word will do always what you said it would do, that it would not return void. Father, I don't know any place else in the world to get the wisdom, to get the understanding, to get the truth like we get out of your Word. I don't know any other place to get it. Lord, my problem is, is applying the truth that I've heard. I pray that you'd help me to apply it as my walk with you, Lord, that I'd not be trying to get pleasure and things, Lord, that you're not against me enjoying, but you want me to do it the right way. I pray, Lord, you'd help me to be obedient to the Word of God. How I need your grace, O Lord. I pray, dear God, today that before these people leave this building, that that sweetness of the Holy Ghost would come upon them. And they would know, Lord, that you love them, and that's why you tell them the truth. That's why you reveal in your word the truth that they need in their lives. And then, Lord, I want to pray this morning. You've sent a lot of young people in this church, Lord. There's some Samsons, Lord. There's some Davids. There's some Esthers. There's some Ruths scattered across this building. And dear Lord, I pray, I know that you don't want them to be... Lord, you said that these things are written for our examples, that we might, through the comfort and patience of the Scriptures, have hope. God, I want them to, I want them to reach the best, God, that you have for them. God, I don't want some of these boys with spiritual eyes gored out, and they grind the rest of their lives at the devil's mill. Dear Lord, help them, I pray. Lord, to be what they can be by obedience and trust in you. These that have come this morning, Lord, I pray that you'll comfort their hearts, Lord, through repentance of sin, and Lord, getting things right with thee. Dear Lord, help the parents of this, and I pray for myself, Lord, that you'll help me to have a, a receptive spirit, a spirit of entreaty to my, to my children, where they could feel like they could come and talk to me when they're being tempted and when they're being tried. Lord, I pray that the hearts of the fathers in this church will be turned toward their children so that the hearts of the children can be turned to their fathers. And Lord, we just need that today. And Lord, we recognize the miracle of our salvation and the mercy of our salvation, of our deliverance. Lord, help us not to misapply, but to take the message and be warned of it, Lord. God, meet the needs of people in this church house today, I pray in Jesus' name. Let us stand this morning together. As we, can we sing just a chorus of To God Be the Glory, Great Things He Has Done. Hello, friend. Thank you for listening to this message from God's Word, the Bible. And this is Pastor Kelly, and I want to thank you for again for listening to this message. And I want to talk to you about the most serious issues that you and I will ever face, and that is our relationship to God. About salvation, about being saved, about being born again, forgiven, reconciled to God. You see, you have a problem, and I had a problem. And that problem is sin. Sin is the transgression of God's law. 
And you and I have sinned. We've broken. In fact, the Bible teaches in James chapter 2, if you broke one, you broke them all. I don't think many of you that are listening would argue with me that we're sinners. Sinners by nature and sinners by birth. And we're guilty before God. Now, you and I are in big trouble because we're in trouble with God. It's one thing to have the law of man and the law of society after you. But it's another thing to have the law of God after you, to be in trouble with God. So we have a problem. That problem is sin. You and I have committed more sins than we can remember. We can't even call them all to remembrance today. There's so many. But I'm glad to tell you, secondly, there's a penalty for sin. And I'm glad of that because I'm glad God's a holy and a just God. The penalty for sin was death. He told Adam and Eve, then the day of the chief thereof, you shall surely die. And they did. They died spiritually. They were separated from God. The word death means separation. And they died a physical death later on. That's why death and destruction and misery and sin of all kinds is around you and I because of sin. But the main penalty for sin is eternal death. That is separation from God in the lake of fire forever and forever, tormented in that fire. That's the penalty for our sin. So we have a problem. We have a penalty. But the greatest and best news you've ever heard is that we have a provision. Jesus Christ, the righteous. God, God knows that we're sinners. And God knows we can't save ourselves. And God knows the condition that you're in out there today. First Peter chapter 3, verse 18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. Think about that phrase. He suffered for sins. The just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Why did he suffer? To bring us to God. The provision is that Jesus Christ paid for your sin by his death, burial, and resurrection. Isaiah 53 says that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The Philippian jailer wanted to be saved and asked the Apostle Paul, What must I do to be saved? And Paul said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. What did he mean, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Believe that he is the Son of God, and that he died on the cross for your sins and rose from the dead. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, and that includes you, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus said, All that come to Me, I will in no wise cast out. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. There was a man one day, the Bible records, who went to a church and he prayed this prayer, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I want to ask you right now to do it. I want you to do it right now. I want you to do it not tomorrow, not the next day. I want you today to cry out to God. If you know that you're a sinner, you agree with God that you're a sinner, and you're under conviction about that sin. Listen, I'm not talking about a fix for all the problems you have. I'm talking about a fix for the situation between you and God. You're living in a world of sin, and you're going to have to deal with that till you die. I'm telling you. But I'll tell you something. It's good to know after you die that you've got a place where there's no more tears and no more sorrow, no more pain, no more sin. No more devil, not even your own flesh nature to have to deal with. And if you'll call on the Lord Jesus Christ, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God wants to save you. He's able to save you, and He's made provision to save you. And the reason we have this truck stop tape ministry is that men, women, young people across America might come to the Lord Jesus Christ and find that there is forgiveness of their sin through His precious blood. I hope you'll do that today. I know a trucker who stopped his truck and got out on the right-of-way and knelt down in the right-of-way and asked God to save him, and God did save him. I know truckers and people traveling who called on the Lord over the steering wheel of their vehicle, and God saved them. It's by faith, friend. It's not by anything else but faith. you just got to believe God. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. It is a gift, and I hope you'll do that. We're not after your money. We don't want it. We just want you to know that God really does love you. Christ really did die for you. And He's risen from the dead. And He's able to save you to the uttermost. He's able to save to the uttermost those who come to God by Him. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you for listening again to this tape and so long.